Mr. Ian McKee is CEO of Euler Company, and he will speak on the topic, the impact of the blockchain on the entertainment industry. Uh, Mr. Ian McKee is an entrepreneur with 20 years of experience, and he's been in Singapore already 22 years, so a long time. Um, he has businesses in Asia, and prior to that in the UK. Um, in 2017, <coughs> So in 2017, Ian saw the opportunity created by the disruption of the industry caused by the OTTs and the power of the blockchain to start Vueler. So Vueler is the B2B TV, film, and sports content rights marketplace. And it transformed the $240 billion broadcast content industry. Uh, then Ian founded Volcanic in 2005, and he led the business to become the largest regional full-service social media marketing firm in Asia with offices in Bangkok, KL, Singapore, and Jakarta. And then in 2014, Ian sold the majority holding in Volcanic to WVP. And today, Volcanic is part of the Group M network. Um, so I think we have a very interesting topic for you today, and hopefully that's also why you showed up in such large numbers. So I think blockchain is one of these topics we've all heard about blockchain, but nobody seems to exactly know what it is. More importantly, many people actually have no idea how it disrupts businesses and what kind of implications blockchain has for uh, businesses. So Ian, we're very happy to have you here today. The floor is yours. We have until 2 p.m. Uh, there will be Q&A at the end. Of course, if you have any urgent clarification questions, uh, go ahead and ask. Yeah, but save them more, let's say, elaborate Q&A uh, for the end. Um, so Ian, we're very happy to have you here today. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Uh, yes, so let me reiterate how to take questions on the way through. So the more we can make this a bit more interactive, uh, the better. So don't say the best till the last. Um, quick kind of one minute profile as to me. Um, so I born and brought up in the UK, and I started my career as a geek and nerdy techie type. I was working for companies like Sun Microsystems and Oracle and, and those companies. And it was doing a geeky, techie, nerdy job that I came to Singapore in 1997. And in uh, 2005, I got bored of that and decided it was interesting to get into the marketing and advertising field. And that there were some technology trends which were converging that meant big change was going to happen. And I didn't have a name for it then, but it, what I was seeing was what is now called social media. And so Volcanic was the first and became the largest social media and digital marketing in that region, focused on that area. Um, and after I sold it, um, I was looking for the next thing that was going to be kind of the next wave. Right? Um, and I saw. Um, I saw the convergence of two things again. One is when you see industries that are themselves under pressure to change. Um, and that means that there is much more uh, interest for something that isn't life as normal. Right? Companies or industries that are profitable and growing actually don't feel the need to change. But when, when things are tough, then people say, okay, we have to do something different. And certainly the entertainment industry is going through massive structural changes. We can talk about that later on as we, as we go through. And then not just the internet, but also the blockchain is an emerging technology. And I think it's still fair to say that it's an emerging technology. And I'm going to kind of spend the first maybe 15 minutes Going back to basics, if that's okay with you, with respect to blockchain. Because um, when I uh, talk to, to audiences, either to one or one or small groups or all bigger groups, I find that everyone's heard of the blockchain, don't quite know what the blockchain is compared to cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and um, And so I'll cover a little bit about that so that you will have like a uh, a foundation layer of knowledge. Um, so without further ado, let's get going. So the first thing 
kind of want to wind the clock back a little bit to explain something to you. Is about a subculture called the cipher punks. So this is a, a group of people who were cryptologists, right? Proto's who were fascinated <clears throat> and world class in the field of cryptology. And there was this subculture going on called the cypherpunks. And if you Google for it, you can see something they wrote, which was the cypherpunk manifesto. And I know those words are too small for you to see. So I've extracted the three key messages that is written into the cypherpunk manifesto. The first is that we as individuals have a sovereign right to privacy. No matter what the government says, no matter what other big organizations say, they should all be secondary to our sovereign right to privacy. And later on, if you want to know the details, we can talk about selective disclosure as well. So that was, that was their first principle. And, and you can read more of their writings. And one of the things that they were getting increasingly unhappy about, and we're now talking perhaps 15 years ago, 20 years ago, one of the things that they were getting increasingly unhappy about was the infringement of our personal rights to privacy. Whether this is agencies of money in the States, like the NSA, which is harvesting every SMS message, every email message, um, and building these massive databases that uh, allow them to basically profile you anywhere and everywhere. Should I be on point of view is no. Um, even governments are infringing on the rights that we, as a democratic country, wherever you have in the world, as a democratic, have granted to the, to the government. The government is now overstepping those rights. And as individuals, they are powerless. Because you can vote this one out, you can vote that one in, they all do the same thing. So that was the first element. And privacy is not necessarily just, I don't want anybody to know anything about me ever, anywhere, anytime. Privacy is about being able to disclose information to people to whom I choose, at the time that I choose, in the form that I choose, and to be able to revoke that access to information about me, so that I retain, I remain in control of my information. And that these other organizations, whether they're government organizations or banks or insurance companies, don't suddenly acquire the rights to the information about who I am. So that was a second tenant of the cypherpunk manifesto. And that's all wrapped up with the idea is that basically I should be the boss of me and everything to do with me. Um, now that you, you, this is revolutionary talk, right? Um, this is basically saying we don't like governments, we don't like the, the, you know, the uh, aspects about big organizations like Facebook and Google and all of the ad serving companies that are amassing so much data about me. And these guys wanted to create a revolution. But they're middle aged men. They weren't going to go out and get guns and go into the street. But they were world class coders. So they started a revolution that we are still at the tip of the iceberg at now by writing code. They wrote software. So what we see now is simply a few steps on from where they started. And what they started was using code to change 
the world that we live in. Right. And if you remember when you're looking at and talking about blockchain, remember that was its origin. It was guys like these who, and there was about 12 of them in a core group. This is just a few. Um, this guy, um, interesting guy, uh, he wrote the core underlying algorithms behind BitTorrent, which has and shares many aspects about blockchain. Right? In that once content is out into the, the torrent community, it can't be taken down. And that's an aspect about blockchain. So that's the, the origins of it. Um, let me kind of give you a quick uh, kind of introduction to, to what it is. I'm going to use, there are many, many blockchains around. Um, but I'm going to use Ethereum as probably one of the better known, most widely used uh, blockchain technologies and protocols. And uh, it's software that was developed after a white paper was written by a guy called Vitalik Buterin, who now lives and works at a carpenter street here in Singapore. Um, and the Ethereum software, the software that you can download for free, and you can put it onto your server, and you can spin up that server with the Ethereum software. And the first thing that this software does is that it reaches out and it connects to other servers that are running the Ethereum software. And so it forms a mesh of interconnected servers that are all running this Ethereum software. And effectively, this layer does a few key things. Um, the first is that it, it provides the mechanism to store data. So in a particular way in the blockchain, but just think of it as a particular way of storing data. And it does it such that that data once stored, can never be altered without there being a visible trace. And it also provides a compute layer called the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine, or you could call it the World Computer, upon which you can execute programs, smart contracts. And those programs, when they execute, run on every server that's running the Ethereum software. And they change the store of data. And that data store is replicated again on every computer in the world that's running the Ethereum software. And that means that even if you're the administrator of one computer, and you have administrator rights, which means that you can get down the operating system to the disk level and you decide that you want to change some of the data, then the Ethereum virtual machine will look and understand that consensus has been broken. The version of the truth on this machine is different from the version of the truth on all the other machines. And therefore, it sees that as a fault. It wipes that store and rebuilds it to be consistent with all of the stores around it. And it's about maintaining consensus. In concept, a relatively simple concept to understand. The implications are massive. The first is that if there is a piece of content on a server today, if the company doesn't want that information to be visible, they can delete it, or they can bring the server down, and they've accomplished it. If there's a piece of information, a video, an image, some writing, that a government doesn't like, they can go to the company on whose server that information is hosted, and they can say, take it down. We censor that. We don't like it. And then in a centralized system, if it's only held on one server, then that information disappears. The government has the ability to control 
But with the blockchain, they lose that ability. Because the government can go and say, I want that server and that server and that server to be taken down. And the blockchain around the world simply says, who cares? We have a copy of every piece of the information that's on those servers, and they sit outside the jurisdiction of that country. So one of the impacts of the blockchain is it removes from large bullies, the companies like Google, or Facebook, or governments, the ability to have control over who has what information. And that's one of the reasons that this whole blockchain is so disruptive and so concerning to a lot of the organizations with it who enjoy the status quo and don't like the idea that this technology means a power shift. There's been power shifts, there are winners and there are losers. So that's the kind of first aspect about the blockchain is that it uh, disempowers governments, organizations, uh, and interest groups. So once information is on the blockchain, it's everywhere in the world, and it can't be taken out. The second aspect about the blockchain is that because of this fact that the data is securely, because the cryptology, kept distributed over thousands and thousands of servers that are themselves distributed around the world, and that because of the consensus mechanism checking to make sure that nobody, either maliciously or, or, or accidentally, um, tampering with the truth, it's being labeled the trust engine. And I think this was, let me see the date, I can't see it. I think this was like 1990-something, late 90s. This was, a, or early 2000s, it was a, an, the Economist front page talking about the, the blockchain and describing it as a trust engine. Because as long as you've got centralized systems, you have to hope and pray as an individual that the data on that system is correct and it will be maintained to be correct. Because it's not within your control. And it is 100% in the control of the person who owns the server. Right. And then a decentralized system, like Ethereum, a distributed ledger, nobody has control over the data. And therefore, since no individual or group of individuals or organization or even government can change the data, then you can trust what's on the blockchain more than you should trust information that's on something centralized. I'm going to give an example. There are many uh, institutions in whom we give perhaps too much trust. One, governments. The other, many organizations uh, like banks. I'm not going to do it. I can point to one of you and say, how much money do you have in the bank? <laughs> and they might say, I don't know, $10,000, $15,000. But if that bank turned around to you and said, there we go. What recourse do you have? What chance do you think that you would have to go to the bank and say, you're telling me I've got 10 and I should have 50? Do you think you'd persuade them? No. So if accidents happen, as an individual, you're almost powerless in that situation. But what about if the bank becomes untrustworthy? 
Do you think that's unheard of? No. About 18 months ago, Wells Fargo were caught because to boost their numbers, they decided they were going to open up lots of new accounts for people so they could start charging them monthly service fees and adding on new services to those accounts so they could charge them additional monthly service fees. And after a few years, they were caught out by journalists that they had done this. And they were taken to court and, of course, now being sued. But here's an example where it goes to show that we should never, ever, as consumers and individuals, be in the situations where <clears throat> we have simply just entrusted a bank or anything else without having the ability to have a check and balance on that organization. So trust is really important. And trust in the data. So the third and final point about the blockchain is that um, if we think about property, physical property, right? If this was an old bar, then if I had it physically in my possession, it was mine. I didn't have legal title to it. But if I came and did a transaction with you, and this is now your gold bar, right? It's a physical item, so I, I, I don't have the gold bar anymore. It sits in your bank vault. Um, so we are used to all of the rights of ownership and of uh, exploitation. Right? You can do what you want to the gold bar. You can make it a jewelry or sell it somewhere else or whatever you want to do. So you are used um, to all of the rights of ownership and exploitation of physical property. And that's well understood because I've been there since, actually since the days of Roman law. But there are other property types, intellectual property, right? Where the property class is of an idea, whether that's a poem, whether it's a photograph, or whether it's a film. These are items of intellectual property. And the internet, computers, and because you, know, you, you do this on floppy disk right, in the old days, but the internet has not yet supported the architecture to allow the uh, parallel of property rights for intellectual property. Because I can have a photograph on my disk and I can send it to you, but I still have that JPEG on my disk, and you now have the JPEG on, the, on your disk. Right? So the idea in that poem that I sent you, or the photograph I sent you, or the film that I sent you, has replicated. Right? And so the internet 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, the got to, has not had the architecture to um, support the ownership of an intellectual property asset versus a physical asset. And that is why we still today have physical currency, because I don't think I've got a dollar, but if I took a dollar out and I gave it to you, it's a physical item. You would have a dollar, you could go and buy your ticket, and I could. And the only way, historically, to enable the fact that you can't double spend is to have a centralized database. A database where in one record, that dollar is either in my wallet or it's in your wallet. And that is why we've had to have centralized systems and we've had to accept that the people that run those centralized systems, like the bank, are trustworthy. This is the point that the blockchain now addresses. Because we can record the original ownership of a piece of IP, a poem, an image, a, 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 a video, or a, a film. Because we can record the ownership of that 
onto the blockchain. And because of its trust aspect, no change can be made to that without there being an audit trail. And indeed, if access to that piece of intellectual property was via a smart contract, also written on the blockchain, then people who don't have ownership or exploitation rights can be prevented from accessing it. You can't see the poem. You can't look at the photograph. <coughs> you can't watch the film unless that right has been granted to you by the owner. Right. You can still transfer those rights in a transaction, and the ledger would record the fact that I owned the rights to that film, but I sold the rights to that film to you, and it's there for everybody to see and for public scrutiny that a transaction was done and a state of rights has been changed. And that ability to encode and record the ownership of and the delegation of exploitation rights of intellectual property is one of the key driving forces as to why this is going to change not just the entertainment industry, but many industries. But you can start to see why this is really important for the entertainment industry, because at its heart, the entertainment industry is an IP business. It's all about the IP. Now, interesting, interestingly, there is another thing, we mentioned it before, which operates like IP, and that is money. Right? Money can only be in my pocket or in your pocket. It can't be in both. Right? And so the blockchain itself, in the same way that it encodes that for intellectual property, is a really interesting and powerful platform to create currencies. And whether you think of this currency as being a store of value, or whether you think of it as a currency, as a medium of exchange, in both of those cases, the blockchain version of a digital currency does this better than a fiat currency, a paper bill issued by the government. And that's where you'll be hearing about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and all of the other coins. We can talk a bit more about cryptocurrencies. The cryptocurrencies are just one use case of the underlying blockchain technology. So Bitcoin is not on its own blockchain. It uses the blockchain architecture to record who's got ownership of that, uh, of that piece of digital currency. So this is a, a really simple example of why the blockchain is going to change the architecture of how we all do business and almost every form of business. So if I make up an example, let's say this is a shop that sells crockery, teacups and teaspoons. And this is a manufacturer of crockery, teacups and saucers and teaspoons. So when the shop runs out of stock on its shelf, it needs to send a purchase order to the manufacturer. That's one of those little lines that goes across. And the manufacturer returns a receipt of the purchase order, say, I got it, here's the delivery date. They might go and manufacture that. Once they've manufactured it, it's sitting in the goods outwards of the manufacturer, and they need to arrange transport. So they send a purchase order to the transport company, who sends them back a receipt for the purchase order and a date to say, my truck will be there. <coughs> then the truck arrives and they pick up the pallet of teacups and there's a bill of lading to say this is what's in that. And then a, another report is sent to the shop that says it's been collected and here's the bill of lading. And the rest of that, and then this last one is the bank, because the bank needs to get involved. 
to be paid to pay the logistics company for doing the transfer and obviously to make the effective transfer between the buyer and seller for the teacups. And you can go through it and understand that each one of those black lines represents uh, an information exchange about an updated state. Right? An order says, I want. A receipt of order says, I got your order. Right? Uh, and in this very simple example, where we've got a manufacturer of teacups and a shop that sells teacups, and a company that ships teacups and the bank, you can see how many exchanges there are of pieces of information. So there are armies of people in each of these companies whose job it is to send these bits of paper out, and then when the thing that comes back, uh, they they reconcile it. What is reconciling? You've seen it probably in the companies you need, you know, there's little administrative parts that sit there a pile of paper, and they sit there with a paper clip gun, right? That's reconciling. Okay, this is the order with the, the receipt. And then they copy it and then they enter it into the system. Why do they enter it into the system? Because as companies today, we only trust the data that's in our system. We wouldn't trust the data in somebody else's system because they have control over it. Right? So you, shouldn't, you couldn't ever trust that. So that means that all four of these, the shop, the manufacturer, the shipping company, the bank, are all keeping duplicate information about the state of the transactions that are flowing between them. That means there are four times as many people needed to reconcile and issue that information and keep it up to date. Armies of administrative clerks who are doing that job roomfuls of people who are doing you know, a white collar but fairly repetitive exercise. But if now, instead of holding that data on our own database, which the other three trading parties, partners don't trust, but if instead we hold the state of those transactions on the blockchain, and because it's the blockchain and because of the technology, all the four trading partners trust that. Then we no longer need to have four replications of that information. We no longer need four teams of people at each trading partner reconciling that information. We might need one. So now we have the kind of societal question, which I won't even touch here, is what do we do with the other three teams of people who now are no longer needed? So that's why I went to my son's school, actually, and I asked the question as I hear at school, and I said, what you're teaching and the way you're teaching hasn't changed for the last 50 to 100 years, but the job sphere, sphere that a 10-year-old kid will be going into today is going to be so fundamentally different. I ask the question, how are you changing what you teach and how to teach to make them ready for the, the environment that they will move into? And unfortunately, it's straight over his head. Couldn't or wouldn't understand the, the implications of what we're talking about. It's sad. So, Bottom line of this is that um, organizations will radically change their shape and architecture when we get to adoption of blockchain, which means that we no longer need to replicate information because of trust issues. And when that happens, it will also open up a huge plethora of completely new business model opportunities. And we'll, we will evolve into a business model innovation driven by blockchain and the trust in the data of the blockchain. So the four key components, just kind of starting to wrap up on this field now, is that the blockchain is often described as a, a a distributed but shared ledger. A ledger is a book that you record everything in, um, and in a mesh architecture, you've got this same book replicated on hundreds uh, of thousands of machines or tens of thousands of machines. 
So once it's recorded, that replication has happened, it can never ever be changed. And therefore the data can be trusted. The cryptocurrency there is all about the ability to protect it in a way that makes it um, impossible to hack. And it's still true to say that uh, the, the blockchain itself to date, none of them all, have, have been hacked. What has been hacked is the juncture between the blockchain and the real world. And the press loves to pick on different hacks and kind of talk about it because um, much of the press is interested in the status quo and is interested in hype. But what is kept quiet by the explicit consent of governments and the press are the hacks that go on every day on MasterCard, on Visa, on the banks, on the ATM networks. Tens of millions of dollars are hacked every day from the existing financial infrastructure. Have none of you ever thought, I wonder why I never see those in the newspaper? We are lulled into a full sense of security by this implicitly accepted complete censorship that in order that the public maintains its trust in the financial infrastructure we depend on, that information is suppressed. So we are not seeing a correct representation of what really happens. Consensus we talked about, and I quickly explained about them, smart contracts, so the idea that you can deploy a program onto the blockchain which implements code, any logic that you like, and will execute automatically to uh, implement whatever the state changes, might be from this wallet to that wallet, to any particular situations that occur. Um, and that this, these four things will change the way that we do business, whether it's financial services, whether it's in the entertainment field, whether it's health records, whether it's in almost everything that we do in that. And just the time horizon. <coughs> um, I think you know, this technology is nascent today. And there's a lot of research, a lot of work being done. But we, we generally always overestimate how much change is going to happen in a year. But it's true to say that we hugely underestimate how much change will happen in five years. So that's my prediction, five years. Five years before you see the start of the impact of this rolling forward. And you know, five years goes past like that. And just to kind of give you an idea of how we've already seen that. Um, I'm sure when perhaps we were all this high and growing up, our parents would have taught us, never go to a strange person's house. For your own personal safety, right? And if a strange man drives up in a car and stops in front of you, never get into his car for your own personal safety. And safety is you know, a very low Maslow hierarchy of needs thing, right? You worry about that before you worry about many other things. And therefore, behaviorally, from a marketing point of view, changing people's perception and attitudes towards safety is very hard. And yet, Uber and Airbnb have done exactly that in a handful of years. So I would guess that every one of us carries an app that calls strangers with their car to come and get us. And we have to be jumping into the car with a stranger every day. And that some of us, when we go on holiday, will arrive at the airport call a stranger to pick us up, to take us to a stranger's house, and we're going to sleep in that stranger's second bed. <laughs> but we're comfortable to do that. 
And I just use that as an indicator of the massive and fundamental sh shift that we as consumers have gone through over the last five or six years, enabled by technology. So they're not blockchain, but the thing that allowed that to happen was a two-sided reputation management system. That's why we trust these people, because effectively the bad actors in that, well, there are always bad actors, but they get taken out because of the, the two-sided reputation management system. So technology solved a trust problem in Airbnb and Uber and all of those. So that's an example of how I think you know, the radical change that's coming that is avalanche size is not being understood by the majority of people. The majority of people either as consumers, the majority of people who are running businesses today. So remember I talked about blockchain enabling this idea about ownership. Um, so I'm going to sort of go into the next piece of my presentation and talking about how when you can encode ownership and exploitation rights uh, onto the blockchain, what becomes possible? Right? And the, you know, the jargon for this is tokenization. Who's, who's heard the phrase tokenization? And I wonder, yeah, what's, what's this all about? Right? So tokenization really is about representing either wholly or in fractions the ownership of that. Um, actually, I think I've taken out the crypto. Who, who wants to have a quick conversation about cryptocurrencies and how they play in the space, or do you want to move ahead straight to tokenization? Crypto. Crypto, crypto. Libra. Libra. OK. Um, so let's start with, with uh, Bitcoin, uh, and then we'll talk, talk about Libra. Um, so um, this Myth, mystical person, Satoshi, wrote the white paper which described the structure and the algorithms to create Bitcoin. And uh, it is a piece of software just like Ethereum is, that people download and they run on their machines and they get called miners. I don't know why they call miners a stupid name, but that's what they're called. And this software does much of what I'm talking about, which is it encodes the ownership. I own this Bitcoin, I transfer it to you, now you own the Bitcoin. Um, and uh, encoded into the software is the inflation rate, which is how many unit Bitcoin are made every day, week, month, and year. That's encoded into the software. Also encoded into the software is the maximum number of Bitcoin that can and will ever be made. So now we have a unit which operates as a means of exchange and as a store of value, which has a known and understood and prescribed inflation rate, and it has a known and understood and immutable supply. And the beauty about it is that it costs next to nothing and happens like that to move any value from one wallet to another wallet. And as a system of doing this, it is so much better than any of the current financial systems. Quicker, faster, cheaper, everything that's in the same up. <laughs> that it worries people. It worries governments. Because this is transnational. No longer can a government manipulate money supply to meet their political ends and do things, you know, do bad things with given complicated names, like quantitative easing <laughs> for their own political ends. Because 
Bitcoin is outside of the control of these organs, the Federal Bank. And that's why people are concerned about it. That's why you'll see lots of the uh, lots of what you see happening. And please apply critical thinking when you're reading about it. Remember that there is a PR war going on out there. On one camp, you've got the people who are advocates and proponents of the idea that um, money is far too important to be left to governments who have political agendas. And it should be entrusted into technology which is open sourced and understood and um, transparent. None of which is true for how governments and their banks actually operate. So in one camp, you've got all of those. And on the other camp, You've got everybody else who is very happy with the status quo. The governments, the politicians, the state banks, and all of the other banking systems, and the guys who are part of SWIFT, and the guys who are part of MasterCard, and the guys who are part of Visa, and everybody else who make massive, obscene profits from doing simple things. So whenever you see this, all of the stuff happening in the press, apply the critical thinking to realize that a lot of what you read is part of a PR, fear, uncertainty, and doubt campaign. So that's kind of like uh, Bitcoin. Any, any questions about Bitcoin? Where it's going? What it, where it's heading? What about the limitations and transactions of Bitcoin? Limitations. So, correct. Um, so people talk about the uh, how many transactions per second, um, and I hadn't looked at Bitcoin's numbers, but Ethereum's number was, was talking out at about 14 transactions per second. Right, so this is nowhere near what a Visa or a MasterCard would need or would be operating at, which is about 10,000 transactions per second. Right? So the technology needs to evolve. Um, the um, the, the answer to that, so the next question is, will it, and how fast will it? And the answer to that is to say, there is an unbelievably huge amount of intellectual capital. Thousands and thousands of the brightest computer scientists in the world who look at the economic advantage that if they crack that, will flow from that. And because of that, Lots of VCs are throwing tons of money at people who are building out infrastructure around compliance, infrastructure about custody, infrastructure about scaling. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that it is simply a matter of time before we get. And there are, there are plenty of um, uh, blockchain protocols like Zilliqa that will perform at 10,000. Mm -hmm. Plenty of blockchain roadmaps, sharding and Casper and all of those other things for Ethereum that will bring up Ethereum and all those other blockchains to be at the same transaction speed. That means that they could take over all of the settlement of the transactions for MasterCard or Visa globally. I think absolute certainty it will happen and in not too much time because the value of getting there is so high. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Sorry. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Um, so, so, so you mentioned about problems with junctures of transactions between uh, what's uh, in the blockchain and then uh, the real world. With, uh, with um, not not the, yeah, I mean you know um, with the stolen uh, cryptocurrencies at the junctures, right? There were problems. Mm -hmm. So is there any way to overcome that? Because uh, I mean, there's an audit trail, right, on on the cryptocurrency. Yeah. Is there any way to recover those stolen cryptocurrency? Okay. So um, to recover now. 
because uh, the whole precept of a distributed ledger is that a transaction is a transaction and it's done and it can never be undone. There is no authority that can say, this transaction, this transaction, and that transaction I like, that can stay. But this transaction I don't like, so I'll reverse it. As soon as you do that, the person who's got that ability has control, and you can no longer trust the data on the blockchain. So unless you do a hard fork and, and, and rub it back, which is kind of like an almost unthinkable thing for, to, for the blockchain community to do now, uh, no, a transaction is done. You, you, you'll be able to see, unless you're using an anonymizing uh, protocol like Monero and some of the other ones, but you'll be able to see that money's gone from this wallet to that wallet. Um, what become, so you know where it is. What becomes challenging is to know who has access to that wallet, because that wallet is just simply a 16 or 24 digit number. And this is where governments are coming into play to say, we need to know the identity based on the identity that we issue, like an NRIC, that this NRIC has control as the ultimate beneficial owner of this Bitcoin wallet. They would love to know that. Because it gets them back to where they were, which is they can snoop on your bank account anytime they like. And now, now all of a sudden they can't. And all of the hype about, you know, we need to know this to prevent terrorism funding and corruption is completely bonkum. Because the vast majority of money laundering happens through the banks. Just look and Google at how much HSBC is being fined. You know, billions and billions. And 50, I can't remember because then the Deutsche Bank was, was fined $15 billion. Fined $15 billion because they were caught money laundering. Right? These are just the ones that we know about. So the people who are, you know, good old traditional currency, suitcases full of cash, and the banks are by far the biggest money launderers today. Hugely out, you know, outweighing the amount that happens through crypto. This is being recorded. I don't know if the banks are going to put me in jail now. So let's move on to the tokenization of, of ownership. So interestingly, the pioneer for the concept was our dear old friend, David Bowie. He was a surprisingly, wasn't surprisingly, he was a, uh, he was surprisingly insightful about the future. If you go back and listen to some of his, in, his, uh, his interviews. And uh, as well as being incredibly creative and talented gentleman. Um, he was also fairly astute from a business point of view. And he realized that his catalog of work, and all the songs that he recorded, have a future value from the rights transactions that will be made for the exploitation of that. And there was a value stretching ahead in the future. And he realized that he was not going to live forever. So what he wanted to do was to enjoy the future stream of income generated by his work, his IP, today. So what he did was he used the financial instrument that was available to him then, blockchain wasn't around, and he created a bond. And he, he set up a company and he transferred all of the IP that he owned to that company. So now that company would enjoy the future income stream. And that company then issued bonds, which entitled the holder of a bond to a share of that future income stream. And so he was able to take the effective net present value of the future income stream of his IP today. Brilliant. I can't remember when he did that. 97. I think it was 97. I forgot it was there. He already did that year and I got to Singapore. What he was doing via the bond was tokenizing the ownership 
of that IP. Right? Before he did that, he there was one person that owned 100% of that future income stream. He put it in the company and he issued, I don't know, a million bonds. And all of a sudden, a million people owned one million of the future income stream from his IP. So this was the very first implementation of the tokenization of ownership of IP. And the blockchain kind of allows that. And, and we'll go through some examples. So the first asset class that's interesting to understand is gold. Owning gold is expensive. Right? What do you think you need to do if you own a million dollars worth of gold? Would you keep it at home and put You put it back. And how much do you think the bank will charge you? A lot of money. And if you wanted to go and go shopping at fair price, and you wanted to pay with your gold, so that's gold as a store of value. But now if you think about gold as a means of exchange, you're going to shave a little bit off, a couple of ounces, and then you hand it over at the cashier. Right? Even if they accepted gold, what would they as a merchant need to do? Well, they'd need to weigh it to make sure that you're getting enough gold to be of the right value. And then they'd need to do something called an assay to make sure that it was real gold of the right purity. Yeah, you have to catch up with the market. Nobody buy that kind of gold. They all buy from the London bullion. No one buy that kind of gold. <laughs> London bullion. Bullion? Yeah, yeah. So it's recognized. It's do you know how many bullion exchanges are in Singapore? Yeah, there's more. Yeah, but there are market makers for that. Correct. So that's the that scenario may not be applicable. No, in most cases. What I'm explaining is that gold is a recognized store of value. It is. It's a very bad means of exchange. It just means that that scenario of purchasing, not so much. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I mean, yeah. I think we all, you know, all realise that was being humorous, that you would have to go with a kind of little chip off your gold block to pay for a fair price. Um, so gold uh, has its advocates as a store of value, but I don't think anybody thinks of it as a means of exchange. Okay? But if you tokenize gold, so you have a gold bullion, and then you divide its worth up into a million tokens, which live on the blockchain. It's not allowed in Singapore. That's my question. I wanted to ask you. Will the compliance come? Yeah. The there are three digits. There are three or four in Singapore digits of <coughs> gold and a few others. It's allowed here tokenization of gold? Yes. You sure? Yes. yes. At the last time we checked, it's not allowed here. It is. We're from the venture company. It so is. What are the names? Yeah. Digits? Yeah. Digits. Yeah. Digits. D I G I X, they run out of Carpenter Street, they're supported by SG Innovate. Okay. Um, there's one out of Malaysia called uh, Hello Gold, I think. In Malaysia. In Malaysia. So this entity is in Singapore. Singapore. This is a Singapore registered entity. Um, and there's quite a few others, and I can point you to those. So the concept here is that you, you take a unit of gold, a, a billion, and you divide it up into tokens, and the tokens live on the blockchain. And those tokens represent your ownership of a share of that. I think what you might be talking about is whether that becomes a utility token or a security token. Oh, for that. This is, this is clearly a security token. So this paper gold you're talking about. Gold. Paper gold. Same as a spider. Metal, metal gold. But right, you're tokenizing the paper where not traded, right? Not tokenization. Tokens. Not securitization. Tokenization as a security token. So same as paper gold. I don't know what you mean by paper gold. Oh, a certificate. Now there are people selling gold shares. Is it called paper gold? Right? Yes, it's called gold. Okay. That's what I so shares of yeah. gold is allowed. But so we're talking about securitization. <coughs> You have a share of a company that's involved in gold. You can have a share of a company that's asset is gold. So these are just equity shares. It's, okay, the difference is on the token, on the paper gold, you don't really own the gold. 
There is a company layer. You don't really own it. Mm-hmm. We want a strict ownership. Split the gold tokenized into pieces. One can own it directly. And if you happen to that asset, I get it back. It's to my collateral. I can even borrow against it. I'm wondering if that's allowed. The first one, yes, is allowed. Mm-hmm. Just like because you're, you're running gold, you're running a, 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 a share. Company. Yeah, that is allowed. I know. So they're operational. And then supported by the government. A, They're in SGA, right? This is a second chance, second scenario. Second scenario. That you own the gold. Mm. Okay, great. Correct. You want to you want to that gold. And as a token, it lives in a digital wallet. It's an ERC20 token. And that means that there are very simple great ways for me to say, okay, we've made an agreement, I'm gonna give you my token, and it's gonna go from my wallet to your wallet without needing to weigh it and do an assay and everything else, I can transact. So all of a sudden, what we've done is that we've made gold more interesting because not only is it a store of value, but it can also be tokenized and used as a medium of exchange. So there are a number of companies who are progressing with this. Not just gold. It can be equally applied, although I haven't heard it, for silver, platinum, or other precious metals, but there are for diamonds. Another uh, asset class. And in fact, many of them combine that with um, certificates of origin so that you know that these are not blood diamonds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. De is not very happy about this. Identity. All of a sudden, we can start to store information about our identity. Factor, doc, dotum, and many of these. And that information is held securely on the blockchain and it's encrypted and kept private. And the concept that they are working towards is that. When someone needs to verify you to do KYC because you're opening a bank account, or to prove that you're 21 so you can get into a bar, instead of having to show them your IC, we're all exposing all sorts of additional information that they don't need to know. They don't need to know whether they're in a Singaporean, they don't need to know your NRC number, they don't need to know your address, they don't need to know your race, they don't need to know your name. What they need to know is, it, our rule is you need to be over 21 to come into the bar. Can or cannot. And the smart contract says, what's your rule? 21? Can. Trust most of us are over 21. Right. So it's a much better way of managing identity and preventing leaks of identity. And it also means that, you know, if you have allowed an organization access to your identity, at some point, if you stop having a trading relationship with that insurance company, you cancel your plan, you can revoke it and remove your information from, their, from them having access to it, which today doesn't happen. In question. Yes. So who's mining it to build the blocks together? There must be... But there must be money involved. So no one's doing this for free, I would think. So, so what's the question? Who's money? Right, who's well, keeping the blocks together in, in fact? Or in the, is it someone doing it for free? No. So most of these are built on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Okay. And the way the Ethereum blockchain works is that uh, people decide to do this, get the Ethereum software, put it on the machines, and off you go. When you write a smart contract, because you're factoring more one of these guys that wants to store or retrieve a piece of information, you have to pay them with something called gas. And that's a tiny little piece of value which you pay for the storing or the retrieval of information. Um, yeah, so that, that's how the, uh, that the economy works. Um, but the balance of it is that um, 
if you were to run this on a centralized system, you would have to pay Amazon and a monthly subscription and a load balancer and everything. Instead here, you just pay a little bit of gas and it gets done. So it's kind of a, a, another layer of abstraction. I think, I'm very excited. I think, um, I think the tokenization of identity is uh, fundamental to the next society that we're going to be moving to, both in terms of how we transact online. How many times have you had to go through and sign up for something? How many times have you had to enter a credit card and a bunch of other details that you want to? That's all because there is no, um, no trusted identity infrastructure on the internet. So everybody has to make it up for themselves and manage it for themselves. And that's why each one of us has, I can't remember what the hell it was, a horrific thing, like 500 to 1,000 places where our data is stored. And most of the time we don't even know, certainly can't remember. So this is, I think, a really interesting area. Um, this and engine, and there are a bunch of others. Uh, are not just about the tokenization of physical assets like gold or diamonds. Uh, there are tokenization of rates, tokenization of property. Right? There's two, two of those that are currently running in Singapore. But this is about tokenizing ownership of virtual assets. If I've got a golden shield or a you know, diamond tipped harpoon gun or whatever you need in Minecraft to be successful, or Fortnite today, right? So ownership of digital assets, so that uh, you, know, you can be more secure about that. So tokenization of blockchain is um, really big in the gaming community. So this is really interesting. It's a company called Brain. And they launched and did an ICO with something called the Basic Attention Token. So what their vision is, is that they are tokenizing your attention. And they do that via the Brave Browser. And the Brave Browser blocks all the trackers and the cookies and blocks the adverts by default. And then you can enable some of these organizations to get access to your data and potentially even serve you ads, but they have to pay you for that. They have to pay you to get access to your data, or they have to pay you to be able to expose their information to you so that they have to pay for your attention. They pay you, not the publisher. And then you, in turn, choose to reward the publishers that you find valuable with microtransactions in this VAT, this basic attention token, to support them to create more and more content that you like. So the idea is that, at the moment, when you're on Facebook, you are the product. You are bought, packaged, and sold to the advertisers. And this, this company's philosophy is that we shouldn't be the product. Our data should not be the currency of exchange. Starting to wrap up now. Um, this company started out called Singular DTV, and they were one of many. And their mantra was to disintermediate the middleman. And what they'll talk about is companies like Netflix and HBO and um, Google with YouTube take all of the intellectual property and exploit it and they don't give a fair share back to the creator of the IP. But because they exist as such new monopolies in their space, there's nothing anyone can do about it. 
So what these guys are proponents of the fact is to say, we can disintermediate. We don't need YouTube anymore. We don't need Netflix anymore. We will use the blockchain. And you can publish your IP on the blockchain, and you can set the exploitation prices. If you're an individual, you want to watch it, it'll cost you 10 cents. If you want to show it to cinema, it might cost you $100. And you've got a smart contract to determine the price that you want to be rewarded for the exploitation of your piece of IP. And you don't need a middleman to manage this process for you, which means that you can get nearly 100% of the revenue earned by the consumption of your entertainment content of your IP. And whilst I'm very um, on board with the philosophy of that, I think these companies are probably too many, too many um, tech guys at the kind of <laughs> at the top position because what they don't understand is how expensive it is to acquire an audience. Okay. They think if I have a thing which allows us a mousetrap and I've got a nice piece of cheese there, then all the mice will come. The reality is that we've seen so many failed. How many of you, how many of you watch Vimeo re regularly for your entertainment? No. Right? And that's already large, well-funded, and established. But Vimeo allows exactly this to happen. It hasn't caught on. Right? There's no reason to think, just because the underlying technology is blockchain, that this will call catch up. The reason being is that for consumers, this is not solving a problem that they find valuable. As a consumer, if I want to step to watch roller skating rabbits and giggling babies, then I've got hours of it on YouTube, and I can watch it for free, and that's fine, I don't mind the efforts. If I want to watch a piece of high value content, like Breaking Bad or whatever, then I'm happy to pay Netflix. And Netflix has done a good job of acquiring me as a customer and of keeping me happy by keeping lots of great content and a nice UI. Um, I don't feel like I have an unmet need for the delivery of entertainment content. These guys are not giving me something that I can't get better, easier, somewhere else. So I think whilst philosophically, their proposition is interesting from a commercial point of view. I don't think they're going to be successful. And summing up, my company. So, tell you a bit about the entertainment industry just to give you kind of a bit of kind of context. Um, on one side of the industry are all of the people who have audiences. So if you're using, for example, you've got the free-to-air broadcaster, in this case, Musical. Then you have the pay TV players, Singtel, Star, and all the channels that you find on those boxes. And then now that we've got the ability to deliver a stream, a video stream, to a phone or a laptop or a box that's plugged into the, the TV over the top of an IP connection, an OTT over the top, You've got all of the OTT players like Netflix and Amazon and iFix and uh, thousands and thousands of other startups in the OTT space. So these are all organizations that have invested and acquired an audience. But the thing that they need in order to monetize that audience, whether that's via advertising revenue or whether it's by subscription, is content. And for the most part, these guys don't make either any or at least the majority of the content that they show. So they need to go to this side of the equation, which are all the companies that make the content. From the film studios to the production arm of the National Broadcaster, BBC Studios, Corp Studios, etc. Down to the thousands and hundreds of thousands 
of independent production companies that make the documentaries and the shiny full programs and all of the other the actual examinations. And then an even bigger plethora of the independent filmmakers who make a lot of the really interesting, creative, good content that we would like to watch. So we have the, the sell side, the people who make the stuff, and we have the buy side, the people who need to buy a package of rights. Say, I want this film, and I want to deliver it across this right, whether it's free to wear, or ATV, or OTT. This geography, this time. And at the moment, that transaction happens at conferences like the one I was at this morning and going back to this afternoon. Park Royal, thousand people in the room from buyers and sellers are all pitching each other and talking about content that they're making, they have got coming. Trying to see and sign, sign deals. It's done face to face and it's super slow. It takes typically four to six months to execute the transaction. Huge amount of manual work to cover off all of the uh, nitty gritty of the transaction. So it's slow, it's very high friction and very cumbersome. And it's all done paper. Right, pencil or paper. Globally, every year, $250 billion worth of rights are transacted. So this is a huge industry that is still working manually. And that's what we've done, is to build an online content rights marketplace where we can enable that same trade, that same transaction, for the same content, the same titles, but to be done on a laptop, by clicking a few buttons. And we've got trades running through the platform now that can be done in under a week compared to six months. Right. So we're just seeing the pickup of that. <coughs> the, typically, the people who make the content are very bad at going out and selling it. Right. And they're film producers and directors and creative people, and they don't want to deal with the business. They just want to go off and make the next film, the next show. They're creatives. So they will often offload the job of distributing and selling their content to broadcasters around the world to a middleman, a distributor. And these guys have historically had a chokehold on the industry. So if you don't work with a distributor, you don't get distribution. You make no returns on having made your film. And the distributors will demand a three-year exclusive contract that will give you no minimum guarantee. And if they do manage to sell your stuff, they'll keep 35% of the value. Right. And in the old days, when the industry was massively profitable and grow growing, because up until very recently, the whole industry was government granted monopolies, right? The government gave the free to air broadcast and the monopoly, right? But now, that money is gone. So the industry has to change. Because right. digital advertising has you know, kicked out one leg from the industry, no longer uh, so many, so much, uh, such a large number of audience watching this, because now we've got Instagram and Facebook and all the other stuff. And then the ability to deliver an OTT so that we can have single global media businesses like Netflix, which are transnational. <coughs> we have never had before Netflix, before the ability to stream over the internet, a transnational media business that will be national. So that's a huge structural change. So when we go out to the business and we say, we, we, can, we can do this, it's free for you to list your films, we don't charge you, we only take a 10% commission when we find you a buyer for a rights package, and 10% is a lot less than 35%. And as a seller, it's no risk for them to come on board, and when a transaction flows through us, they get to keep 25%, a quarter more of the value of their film or their show for them to reinvest in making more content and better content. Right. So it's a very marketable um, proposition to the industry. 
Does it make the content cheaper on this particular marketplace because you have your kind of uh, matching the? Could you start that question again? Yeah. I mean, yeah. does it make the content cheaper to be on this marketplace? Is it a The content yeah. itself, you know, it does that become cheaper because you're saying that the percentage is uh, down. Um, so the setting of the price is done between the seller and the buyer directly. We don't get involved in the transaction. We're not a party to the transaction. So, um, how much of that saving is retained by the buyer, and how much of that saving is enjoyed by the seller is really up to the power equation between the buyer and the seller. It's a very big buyer and a very small seller. It'll go one way. It'll go the other way. So it's now just down to the laws of economics. But the, you know, one of the reasons that um, I, I'm building this business is, is a few things. First of all, as a digital platform with a, a free to list kind of business model, I'm democratizing the access to distribution. So it was historically, you know, if you were a white middle-aged Anglo-Saxon man in Hollywood, then it was easy to get your film distributed. Right? If you weren't, it was probably a lot harder. But with the digital marketplace, you know, everything digital is completely blind to who you are and where you come from. So you can democratize the access to distribution. We can make distribution, um, or how well your content performs, really only based on one piece of metric, the quality of your content. Not how much you can spend in setting up offices in every country and hiring expensive salespeople to go and push your content, right? Every piece of content has an equal chance on a digital platform. And lastly, by reducing the friction in the whole industry so that a transaction can be done and the cost of that transaction is 10 cent versus the same transaction costing 35 cent, we're releasing 25% more of that value back to the industry. Now, I don't know whether it goes into this pocket or that pocket, but it's there in the industry. And a lot of the broadcasters you know, need more money. Not many of them are as profitable as they used to be. And certainly, all of the content creators, whilst they're enjoying a the boom at the moment, all, they all want to see higher value for the film or their TV show that they want to see. So we are uh, releasing money back to the industry. At the moment, that money is bled away by the fact that in order to get distribution, they, a person has to fly to a trade event. Right? Um, in October, the big one is in Mitcom in the south of France. Then about three quarters of those people in December fly to Singapore to go to ATF, the Asia TV Forum. So there's this kind of big, Harder of people in the thousands that fly around the world to different expensive locations. They stay in expensive hotels, okay, the MBS equivalent. They pay a lot of money to organizations like big exhibitions to rent 6, 12, 20, 30 square meters. And then they pay a lot of money to expensive organizations like Pico to erect a booth which will cost them 100, 200, the one at Hong Kong, I went to the PCCW booth, and I know people there in, in Hong Kong, at Hong Kong Film Up. Their booth cost them $200,000 to construct. Because they had to have the biggest booth to show off, right? And it went up on the Tuesday, and on Friday, the bulldozers knocked it down. $200,000. For three deaths. Right. This is value that is just bleeding out from the real ecosystem, which is the consumers, the broadcasters, and the creators. Right. These are the these are the, the real players in the ecosystem, and this is where we need to have more money in that content economy, not being paid to airlines and hotels and read and booth builders. They don't create anything that the audience enjoys. So how about the discoverability aspect? So my content, right, if I have a booth, yep. then I can have constructed sort of an expensive booth for people to discover my content. 
but on this particular marketplace, uh, how does that work? We take responsibility for marketing your content. Oh. We raise the money, we spend the money, we use more digital marketing techniques to do that. So you can you can spend, you know, I don't know what booth rental, but let's say it was probably maybe another hundred thousand dollars. So that PCTW stand cost, should we say, three hundred thousand dollars for three days, and. I'm guessing that there were between five to 10,000 people who went to the exhibition and may have walked past your booth, right? So, just do the maths as to how expensive it is to give you reach to such a small um, audience. For $300,000, I can make sure that your piece of content is seen by almost every buyer in the world, if I do it digitally. Yeah. Just digital is more cost effective. It's but a large part of the industry is predicated on optics. I mean, they, they know they're spending $300,000, but it's a $300,000 flex. Right? They're saying, look at how much money we, we can spend. This is nothing. And we're going to have this big press conference, and you know we've got these eight titles that are going to knock your socks off, versus the little guy you know who probably scraped together as much as he could to, to do another you know 50 grand for his own space, and PCCW or ABC, ABSCBN or any of these guys can say no 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 look at us yeah. by democratizing this you know and and going through a platform for, for like yours which again the philosophy is fantastic but. Now you're removing the ability to flex. I agree. So how, wh why would a, a content creator of that scale want to engage in something like this? Um, because they are unhappy with the result of all of their flexing. They are finding increasingly that flexing is not cost effective. Mm -hmm. Been there before. Um, but now they need to reach further into not just the core markets, but the secondary markets, and maybe even tertiary markets, where even they, with their ability to flex, don't have the resources to go and sell. So they come to us for the ability to do that. Obviously, you know, if you're, if you're a Hollywood filmmaker, then you're going to walk next door and have a face-to-face -face conversation with Netflix, and that trade, that transaction, is never going to get done on a marketplace. But that represents a very, very small proportion, both in number of transactions and in total value. Out of the total system, right? Netflix's entire content budget is a mere $16 billion, right? Bigger than anyone else. But that's out of a global budget of $240 billion, right? So the uh, math is that's 220 something billion left for everybody else <coughs> to be transacting. So, yeah. And the idea is, we don't ask for exclusivity. Hmm. So the, the real answer to the question is, go ahead and flex away. We'll look after everything else. We don't stop you from having the both. Mm -hmm. And in the end, you know, what we predict is that the moment these guys will go to maybe six of these trade events in a year, mm -hmm. because they need to get that exposure. Once we get rolling, they might pull that back and say, we need to go to the three big ones. And they'll cut out one or two. So I think it won't ever stop. It'll just change. Mm -hmm. I think we need to at least officially wrap up this session. <laughs> I think there are many more questions, and that's great. So, so I know you have to take more questions, but some people need to move out. So, uh, all right. so otherwise, it's I was just going to about the role of the blockchain in that. So, Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. So, so uh, I'm sure Ian wants to take more questions. So, so those of you who have questions, just stay behind and, and talk to you. That URL is.